look at our Westminster Confession of Faith. We've begun a study in that confession. This will be the first time that I go through that uh, as a, an object of study during our homilies on Sunday morning. We've gone through the shorter and larger catechisms actually a couple of times now over the years. Uh, but now we'll look at the confession, which is a, a more uh, fuller exposition of the teaching of the scriptures uh, and very, very helpful in terms of developing our understanding of God's Word. So we are uh, looking at the first chapter and sections 2 and 3 this morning, and I've excerpted a part of section 2 for you. I'll explain why in a moment. Um, maybe I should ask if any of you know what's missing. <laughs> maybe some of you do. Uh, but let me read the two sections for you, and then I'll make some comments on that. Under the name of Holy Scripture, or the Word of God, written, are now contained all the books of the Old and New Testaments, all of which are given by inspiration of God to be the rule of faith and life. The books commonly called Apocrypha, not being of divine inspiration, are no part of the canon of Scripture, of the Scripture, and therefore are of no authority in the Church of God, nor to be any otherwise approved or made use of than other human writings. Last week we spoke about how God has revealed Himself in nature, in our own hearts and consciences, and ultimately in special revelation in His Word. And so Scripture comes to us as the uh, final revelation of God given to us for our uh, faith and for our lives. It is written down for us so that we might know the things that God has for us. We can examine them, uh, we can remember them, uh, and uh, grow accordingly. So we have a written revelation from God that Revelation is written in such a way that the authors were inspired by the Spirit. And what they spoke was the very words of God. What they wrote was the very words of God. We'll consider that more fully in the weeks to come. But the, the, the testimony of Scripture is that you have God revealing Himself to the prophets and the apostles, and they put these revelations down into writing by the superintending work of the Holy Spirit such that what they wrote was not merely a witness to revelation for them, but was in fact the Word of God in propositional form. Now we'll consider that more in the weeks to come. But our, in this section here, we're going to reflect on the nature of the Scriptures as canon or the rule of faith uh, given to us. There is a, as probably you realize, there is a list of books of the Bible given to us in the confession that is excerpted from this uh, quotation uh, of the books of the Bible that we recognize as being the authoritative word of God. Uh, there are 66 books to the Bible, 39 in the Old Testament, if you use our English Bibles, for your account, the uh, Hebrew uh, combines uh, the books of Samuel and Kings and Chronicles and that sort of thing, so uh, they have maybe a, a lower number. Uh, but then in the New Testament, you have uh, 27 books uh, in the New Testament. All of these books are given at different times by different authors under different circumstances, and yet their message is one harmonious whole. Uh, it's the revelation of God to us of the way of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. The Confession uh, speaks about uh, the Scriptures then as the Word of God written and contained in these books. Uh, so, we don't have time obviously to go through all the books of the Bible. You'll note if you uh, take the time to just look at your table of contents for your Bible itself that there are the first five books of Moses, which are the law of God, you have their law in terms of the moral law as we're considering the Ten Commandments given in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. You also have case law or the civil law 
which takes the moral law and applies it to the circumstances of life in which the Jewish people found themselves in the wilderness, but also when they would get settled in the land of Palestine. There was also the ceremonial laws given in these books. In Exodus, the latter half of the, chap of the book that we'll consider in the weeks to come. Leviticus, of course, gives a considerable exposition of the ceremonial laws. Those laws are with regard to the temple, the priesthood, the sacrifices, all these kinds of things. So the uh, Pentateuch, the first five books, are written by Moses under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. Uh, they contain law, but they also contain historical narrative as well. Uh, the account of creation, the fall into sin, uh, the judgment, uh, the, the uh, development of the human race, the flood of Noah, uh, then God's choice of the family of Abraham, and setting them apart from the nations of the world. And then God uh, focusing on the family of Abraham, uh, Isaac and Jacob, and then the tribe of Judah, out of which the, the Christ would come. Later, as we go on in the, the remaining scriptures of the Old Testament, we would see that the Messiah who is coming from Abraham, uh, Judah, would also be a son of David, and he would be the Christ uh, to bring us salvation. So you have these first five books which lay the foundation for everything that follows after that. So the historical narratives that you have uh, follow this in uh, the books of uh, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, and the Skip the first and second Samuel. Uh, anyway, all these historical books are showing us the application, really, of the law of Moses to the history of Israel. And as they followed that law, they were blessed. God provided for them in a marvelous way. But when they departed from God's law, they came under God's curse and judgments. And so, as the book of Judges reminds us, um, you have the, the cycle that goes through the history of Israel from their obedience to law and blessings, and, and, but then when they disobeyed God, fell into sin, then they were brought into judgment. Eventually they would cry out to God, God would send a deliverer, and then they would be restored back into fellowship and favor with God, and the nation would be blessed. So that is kind of the historical books. You also have poetic books. The writings, uh, the books of Psalms uh, and Proverbs, Song of Solomon, uh, Lamentations. Uh, these uh, writings uh, are books that uh, make a, a good deal of use of uh, poetry and also proverb. Um, they have all kinds of metaphors and images that, that are typical with poetry. Uh, and they give expression to the, the spiritual life of the people of God through uh, the Psalms. The Psalms are part of the worship of God's people, and so we include them even in our worship today. Uh, the Psalms were the hymn book for the church under the Old Covenant period of time. Proverbs, of course, are wise sayings instructing us in the law and teaching us to obey God and they're given in short statements, brief statements, that uh, we can memorize and keep in our hearts uh, to guide us in life on all kinds of practical matters. Uh, I remember uh, Dr. J. Adams described the Proverbs as like a gumball, which you would uh, put in your mouth. Years ago, when I was a kid, you would go to the corner store and put a quarter in the little gumball machine and get a candy to come out. Maybe it was a hard candy or something that you would chew. But anyway, you put that in your mouth and suck on it for quite a while. And uh, Adam says that the Proverbs are like that. They're like, like these condensed statements that uh, you, you can uh, revel in, think about, and, and uh, savor as you apply them to the circumstances of life. So in Proverbs, you have a father teaching his son so that he can be mature and uh, a faithful servant in God's kingdom. They are the sayings of wisdom, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So you also have the prophets in the Old Testament, major and minor prophets. The major prophets are major in the sense that they have large 
uh, books that they've written. So it's Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, Daniel. Uh, these are the major prophets. Uh, the minor prophets are not somehow inferior or less in terms of not being quite as inspired or informative or what have you. They just are smaller books. Um, so you have the, the prophets of the Old Testament who uh, oftentimes uh, bring God's covenant lawsuit against his people for their sin. And so they, they come in the form of a kind of covenant lawsuit. They have broken covenant with God given to them at Mount Sinai and in the laws of Moses. And now the judicial sanctions of that covenant are being brought to Israel. Isaiah warns about the judgments to come, Jeremiah especially, with the uh, coming of the nation of Babylon and the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, they, they warned of judgment, but also they prophesied of the coming of the Christ. Uh, and you can see, uh, like Isaiah 53 in particular, uh, a wonderful depiction of the offering of Christ, the servant of the Lord for us, by his sufferings and death on the cross. And so these are the old covenant scriptures that are given to us by inspiration of God. The church recognized these as authoritative. They were the word of God. And so when you come into the New Testament and you read through the Gospels and the epistles of Paul, they don't question the authority of the old covenant. Even though Christ has come, the kingdom of heaven has arrived, uh, the Spirit has come down upon the church. There's new revelation. They don't look back on Moses and the prophets and the rest of them, the Psalms, and say, well, these things are uh, not inspired or these were mistaken in some form or fashion. They were subject to the culture of the day, and uh, we have advanced beyond that, as what you hear oftentimes in the modern pulpit today. No, they recognize the divine authority of Scripture. Jesus often enforced the authority of Scripture, recognizing it as true. And when he did uh, address things in Scripture, as in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, um, and he says, you've heard that it was said that long ago you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery. Um, he was interacting not with the law of Moses in such a way that he was contradicting it, or saying it's no longer relevant or valid, rather he was uh, attacking the false interpretations of that law by the Pharisees and the scribes that have accumulated over the years through the tradition of the elders and so forth. And so Jesus upholds the authority of Old Covenant Scripture, and so do the apostles. The Apostle Paul says, all Scripture, thinking principally of the Old Covenant, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. And so the, the, the New Testament testifies to the Old Testament that this indeed is the very word of God. We're not departing from that word. We hold it to be true. And the faith that we proclaim in Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of what the Old Testament foretold. So there's unity and harmony there between Old and New Testaments. Jesus promised his disciples that they would receive the Holy Spirit upon his uh, resurrection into heaven, ascension into heaven. And they received that Spirit. The Spirit would be a comforter and a teacher. He would lead them into the truth, and they would be witnesses to Jesus. And so they receive inspired revelation from the Spirit of God. They give testimony to Jesus. They write down that which was given to them. And so we have our Gospels, the Epistles, uh, and uh, the apocalypse as well. So we have this uh, testimony of Scripture. Indeed, even within the New Testament, you have witnesses to the divine inspired authority of the New Testament writers. The Apostle Peter says of the Apostle Paul that his writings uh, are hard to understand, which some distort as they do the rest of Scripture. Peter, who had been rebuked by Paul on a couple of occasions, Peter, who uh, you know, had his issues, uh, recognizes that Paul's writings were authoritative scripture, on a level with Old Covenant scripture as well. 
And so it, it, you can, uh, and, and Paul will, will uh, recognize Luke's writings and, and quote from Luke in uh, his writings uh, in, in 1 Timothy, I think it's chapter 5, uh, when, when he says that the laborer is worthy of his wages and points to the Lord saying these things, uh, he, he uh, very uh, deftly uh, asserts the authority of Luke's gospel as the word of God. So we have this canon of scripture, this rule of faith to guide us in the course of life. And that is uh, what we follow. Now there are some churches, and I, I want to be very brief on this, uh, that have a collection of books in between the Old and New Testaments <coughs> called the Apocrypha. It's the books of Mac Maccabeans and, and, and so forth. And these are historical works on the for the most part, in the intertestamental period. Uh, the, the book of Malachi was composed in about the 4th century B.C. Then you have a 400-year period between uh, Malachi's book and then the, the first book of the New Testament. Maybe that was the Gospel of Mark. Maybe it was Paul's letter to the Galatians. You can uh, argue back and forth on that. But uh, between that period of time, there were these historical works which themselves do not claim to be inspired word of God. They don't have the, the statement that you find in the prophets, thus says the Lord. They don't put themselves on that level. They are historical accounts of the experiences of the Jews uh, in, in that period of time. And so like any other historical work, uh, the works of Seneca, the works of Herodotus or what have you, we receive them as information, we study them, we learn from them, but we don't receive them as inspired in the word of God. Now they might provide some helpful background to New Testament writings and kinds of things that are said in the book of Jude, Peter's writings as well. There are sometimes maybe some reflections on those books, but they themselves are not inspired. And so we do not include them in the canon of Scripture. Uh, in most Protestant Bibles, you won't even find them in your copy of the Bible. Um, the Roman Catholic Church will include them in their Bible and some other uh, churches as well. Um, the, the danger there is that if you include them, then it makes it appear to the uninformed uh, reader that they are on the same level as the rest of Scripture. Uh, that's very much like uh, the challenge that the criticisms that were given to the uh, uh, the Bible produced by Schofield, Charles Schofield, the Schofield Reference Bible, and people were concerned that the, the notes in the Bible uh, could be confused as part of the Word of God. And so, whenever you look at the Bible, a study Bible, be cognizant of the fact that those notes are not, of course, inspired scripture. They are the opinions of, informed opinions of theologians and so forth on the text. So we'll finish there uh, on our uh, consideration of the, the uh, scriptures to this point, and let's go to the Lord in prayer and bring our request to him.